I just wanted everyone, just quickly for us, uh, to, to take a quick second and just take a deep breath. Uh, and you can let it out as you need to, but don't blow on anybody and nothing like that. Um, these are tough conversations that uh, need to be need to ha happen. For some folks, these conversations can be traumatizing or re-traumatizing. Um, this is not an easy conversation by any means. None of these panelists had to do this. All of them are here, taking time away from their families, taking the time away from the people that they love and care about to be here. Y'all have come here to be here. Um, what's most important is that we have a productive and constructive conversation today. As close as we can get to that, we will, we will try. Um, but what I wanted to do was just start with gratitude uh, that you took the time to be here and be a part of this very important conversation, knowing that this is difficult, knowing it's not easy. And for those of you who have to hear this stuff over and over and over again, uh, whether it's because you are an elected official uh, working on this stuff, or you have been in the streets working on this, or you, your families have been affected by this, or if you're just someone who cares because this is a human rights issue, just thank you for being here. If you could give yourselves a round of applause and our panel a uh, round of applause before we start. That'd be great. Amazing. Uh, great. I feel like I'm at one music fest already, so this is great. Um, it is my pleasure to just thank a couple partners as well. Um, I'll introduce myself again later. My name is Rohit Mohotra. I'm joined by Saba Long. We'll be moderating the conversation uh, this evening. Uh, but it's very important that I thank a few key partners. Uh, if you are not uh, following local journalism and the movement around local journalism that is happening in our city, in our state. Uh, you are missing out on true, like really different types of storytelling that actually make sure that perspectives that are often left out of the conversation are heard. So I wanna first start by, um, by thanking uh, Atlanta Civic Circle, which is headed up by uh, Saba Long uh, for the work that they do. Round of applause for Atlanta Civic Circle. Yeah, I'm gonna make y'all clap. It's gonna be great. We're gonna we're gonna uh, keep the energy up. Uh, I want to give it up for Canopy Atlanta as well for the work that they do inside of neighborhoods, communities, telling stories, uh, and, and turning neighborhoods into the the centers of storytelling. Um, uh, if y'all have not heard of Capital B, you better start following them now. Big big up to Capital B, making sure that. Uh, black stories and black narratives are at the center of our journalism here in Atlanta and around the country. So a big round of applause for Capital B. Uh, I also want to uh, thank the ACLU of Georgia uh, that has helped us uh, facilitate this conversation. That's also been extremely uh, important. So thank you to the ACLU of Georgia uh, as well for the work, uh, work that you do. Uh, and I'm gonna turn it over to an incredible uh, you know, uh, set of folks who are going to introduce, a, give a little bit of background. They're gonna do a few more thank yous because we know that we got some thank yous in order for this library that is hosting us uh, and the folks who helped us get here. So thank you so much for hosting us here. And I'm gonna toss it over to my colleagues here to go with the conversation, but I know y'all are gonna be in it. Yeah, it's perfect, awesome, so excited, thanks. So uh, thank you, Rohit, for passing the mic and uh, the technology issues we'll continue to work with. Uh, my name is Kyle Kessler, and this is Madeline Thigpen. And uh, welcome to our event this evening. We will go through these quickly because we you know we have a lot to program to do, and the library closes at 8 o'clock. So first off, we do want to thank uh, Fulton County Board of Commissioner uh, for District 4, uh, Natalie Hall, who's with us, um, and for the staff and the um, Folks here at the Central Library, uh, welcome back to this facility. Uh, for those of you who have not been here since the renovation or through the pandemic, uh, it's good to be back uh, in this newly renovated building. So thank you uh, for everyone who's up to make that possible. And uh, as a disclaimer, <laughs> um, this is the standard library disclaimer. So this event uh, program is not sponsored, endorsed, or approved by the library system or Fulton County government, but we do thank our Fulton County participants uh, for being on the panel this evening. Uh, we do have uh, some technology. If you're interested in providing a question to our moderators to ask the panelists, you can submit that here, either with a QR code or the web address. Uh, we will get that posted on the live stream as well. Uh, with those questions, we will be getting to the moderators to ask the panelists. Uh, we will show the slide again, uh, but go ahead and take note of it now. Uh, Slido.com. 
uh, with the code 2615917. And then also our folks, our friends at Fulton County have also set up a special landing page for this event. Uh, so if you're interested in seeing more data, more presentations uh, related to the topics we'll be discussing this evening, uh, you can access that uh, through the QR code as well or through bit.ly uh, slash 2Js, number 2Js. So we are going to go through just a few sort of key terms um, just to make sure and some other sort of highlights. So the first one that I just wanted to go over with everybody is a jail. Um, so somebody who's in jail has not been convicted of a felony yet. Someone who's in jail is either serving a sentence for their misdemeanor or they have not yet gone to trial. Um, so Fulton County Jail does serve as a pretrial detention center. And Yeah, we'll, we'll trust that you can read, but just to add a few highlights here, on here as well. So the reason we're here, particularly this evening, is there has recently been an intergovernment agreement between Fulton County and the city of Atlanta to lease uh, the city detention center. But there is some backstory to this as well. There were conversations that started last year, but even before that, uh, there was a task force created in the city of Atlanta to reimagine the city detention center. Some of that is uh, moving forward with the Center for Diversion, which our panelists will talk about. But Fulton County has had uh, jails for a long time. The city has had a detention center for a long time as well. Uh, so just give you a little bit of backstory about some of the process until we got here. Um, just to make sure that we're clear about the different uh, facilities that we're talking about. We're talking about Fulton County Jail, um, but there are multiple facilities. Um, and we appreciate the uh, additional technical support we received on the specific numbers. But the main jail, um, which is known as Rice Street, uh, exists uh, and has about a 2,200 uh, bed capacity. Uh, we are here because it is currently overcrowded. Um, additionally, there are annexes uh, in North Fulton as well as South Fulton um, and a facility adjacent to the Rice Street facility as well. And in addition to those that the county directly has access to, the county is currently leasing about 300 beds in Cobb County as well. And then the city detention center um, has about 1,300 bed capacity. Uh, currently, based upon some uh, reforms that have happened in the past few years that Madeline will speak up in just a minute, the current detainee population is averaging less than 50 people per day. Uh, but the city of Atlanta is currently spending, in the fiscal year 2023 budget, about $16 million uh, for corrections, which is mainly for uh, operations of the city to do this. Okay, so reimagining ACDC is a task force. Um, but before the task force was created in 2018, there were a few reforms that are important to note. One, cash bond was done away with, and so signature bond is now for nonviolent offenses. And also in 2018, mayor, former Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms ended the contract with ICE, and ICE was using the ACDC as a detention center. And the task force, which a few people that were on the task force are also on our panel here, um, came up with four recommendations for what to be done with ACDC, because at the time, mayor and city council were planning on closing the jail. All of these are community programs that are meant to help uh, neighborhoods and help different communities uh, throughout Atlanta. So one thing that our panelists will talk about as well, particularly those from Fulton County, is Project Orca. Um, so during the pandemic, the court system was closed for a period of time. That led to a backlog when uh, folks could not be before a judge, not go to trial. Um, so there has been COVID, federal COVID money allocated to help address that backlog, um, and the panelists can help speak to the current status of that. Um, as I mentioned before, we have this recent intergovernment agreement, uh, which will allow Fulton County to lease up to 700 beds for up to four years um, at the city detention center. Some of the details are here. Uh, there will also be a link, uh, or should be on the, the website as well. Um, in addition to that, Fulton County has been going through a process of doing a jail feasibility study that was authorized by the Board of Commissioners at the top of this year. It should be available here soon, but that will be something that will be discussed through the panel. And then lastly, uh, last year the city of Atlanta in partnership with Fulton County created a Justice Policy Board. Uh, one of the things that they have been tasked with with this most recent intergovernment agreement is to do a population review. 
And that committee, or that board, has created a population review committee to do a report on uh, the uh, detainee population, how long they've been there, uh, what the bonds are, um, and how things can be addressed. So that is something that will also come up through the conversation. So once again, we thank you uh, for coming. Uh, I will kick it over to our two moderators, uh, Sab along with Atlanta Civic Circle and Rohit Mahotra from the Center for Second Nation. We'll introduce our panelists and get started. Um, and once we get started, I will put back up the Q&A uh, QR code and address so you can grab that as well and start to feed some questions to our moderators. So thank you for joining us and let's get started. All right, thank you, Kyle. Thank you, Madeline. Can we give them a round of applause? Thank you. Um, we're going to go ahead and dive right in. Again, thank you for, for being here uh, today. Um, we wanted to just start off by giving you an opportunity to very, very quickly introduce yourselves. We'll make sure bios and stuff are, are distributed. Um, we have a lot of things that we want to get through today, so um, if we at any point are uh, moving the conversation along uh, by interjecting, uh, know that it, it is purely for the sake of time, um, not out of any sort of respect for you or the, or the work that you do. Um, so I, I wanted to just have you quickly just introduce yourself, um, which organization you are with or who you are representing today, and, and why, uh, what brought you to this work? Um, what is it that brought you to this work? If there's a singular moment or thing, uh, not time for a full story, but uh, just a thing that brought you. And, and Robin, I couldn't think of a more perfect person to start than, uh, than you. Thank you, Ernie. Um, my name is Robin Hassan. I am the executive director with Women on the Rise. Um, short story of how I'm into this work is I am a formerly incarcerated woman. Um, I spent 10 years inside the Georgia State Prisons here. Um, and during that time, I learned that prisons and jails do not provide the solutions. Um, once you go in, because of things that are happening on the outside, once you come out, you are in a worse situation than when you went in. Um, so I'm here to try to help find solutions to help our people rather than to hinder them. Uh, my name is uh, Alton Adams. I am the Chief Operating Officer uh, for Public Safety and Justice at uh, Fulton County. Uh, I joined the county uh, four years ago after having retired from the private sector because I wanted to uh, make a contribution, make a difference in a, uh, in a different way. So my role is supporting amongst other things, uh, the sheriff and the, uh, the chief judges of the various courts that are part of Fulton County, uh, as well as working closely with, uh, with a number of the other uh, justice partners. Good evening, everyone. So wonderful to see you. My name is Tiffany Roberts. I am the public policy director at the Southern Center for Human Rights. We are a nonprofit law firm committed to decriminalizing race and poverty in the Deep South. Um, and what brought me to this work is um, a number of things. I am the daughter of a community organizer, deeply invested in self-determined change within communities um, that considers people to be assets, um, but resources, right, and blessings are capable of determining for themselves how to forge better futures. Hey, good evening. My name is Patrick Labat. First and foremost, thank you. The library is beautiful. I haven't been here since the third grade. Uh, <laughs> we'll leave that, 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 that there. Uh, born and raised right here in, in Atlanta from Frederick Douglass High School to Clark Atlanta University. Started my career in law enforcement 11 at night to 7 in the morning, working in the city jail, where for the next 20 years, I worked my way up through the ranks in 2010. I was appointed chief by then Mayor Reed and spent the next decade uh, really trying to figure out how we could affect our community in a different way when it comes to pretrial, when it comes to jail. Starting the PAT-3 program, one of the most groundbreaking programs in the country, reintroducing and creating viable work options for individuals that are still city employees. So that, to the, to the contrary, uh, had an opportunity to run for sheriff again for my third time, third time being the charm. I won after I retired. So I was retired for a year and haven't quite figured out why I got back into it. 
uh, because I was having a good time playing golf and, and walking every day. But service is in my heart. Becoming the sheriff is, is one of the things that I aspired early on in my career. And so to that extent, I won. I'm the 28th sheriff of Fulton County. And certainly, um, thank you for having the conversation. And for me, it, what brings me here tonight specifically, other than Saba telling me to be here, uh, is quite simply being able to have an honest conversation and really get the facts, right? And I say this all the time, people are entitled to their own opinion, but not entitled to their own facts. And so it allows us to give out uh, some of the facts and, and enjoy the conversation. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Eric Donaway. I'm one of the 20 Superior Court judges for the Atlanta Judicial Circuit. Thank you all for having me. Thank you, um, Rohit, for the invitation. Um, I got into uh, the legal field um, at a young age. My father put into me that he wanted me to be a lawyer. Um, I couldn't hit the baseball well enough to play for the Atlanta Braves, so I gave up that dream and went to law school. I went to uh, law school down in uh, Mercer, in Macon, Georgia, after graduating from Morehouse. Um, and much like the sheriff, I'm born and raised here in Atlanta, Grady Hospital, Westlake High School. Morehouse College. Um, and I always knew I wanted to come back to Atlanta, Fulton County, um, and work in the community that it put so much in, into me. Um, so I came back home and immediately went right to work in the old city court of Atlanta. Um, the old city court of Atlanta, we did DUI trials and traffic. Uh, everybody knew this traffic court. We did DUI trials and traffic tickets and hit and run trials. Um, and I tried about 20 cases down there, jury trials down there, and I enjoyed um, the courtroom work. I went to the Fulton County DA's office. I um, eventually went to the DeKalb County DA's office as head, as head of their domestic violence and sexual assault division. Um, and then opportunity presented itself in 2016. I actually uh, went out, spoke to um, the citizens, ran, um, and was uh, fortunate enough to be elected by the citizens of Fulton County um, to the Superior Court bench. Um, I took the seat in January of 2017, so now I'm about six years into the job. Um, so thank you all for having me. Thank you for being here. Um, so I want to start with a very basic set of premises. Uh, number one, uh, if you would disagree with what the sentence I say, uh, raise your hand. Uh, number one, the jail at Fulton County today has more people in it than it does beds. You disagree with that? Oh, okay. It's all good. No, yeah, I took it as a fist, so it's all good. Uh, so we are all in agreement. The jail at Fulton County today has more people in it than beds. Number two, there are people in that facility today who should not be there. Is there any disagreement about that? You believe that anybody who is in that facility should be there. It, is there anyone in the, what I'm saying very just, just point blank is, there's a facility, there's more people than beds. We all agree. Second question is, that facility does have people today who should not be at that jail. Is there disagreement with that sentiment? Okay, so you disagree with that, and Sheriff Labat, do you disagree with that? I'll let you all clarify in just a bit, but I just want to know what you you disagree with it. Okay, so let's let's just go ahead and start the conversation there, right? Um, because I think that's going to be uh, where the point of contention seems to lie, which is that every single person who is in the facility today should be there. Um, so. Let me start with those who oppose that sentiment. Uh, Tiffany, why is that true in your mind versus false? All right, so just by way of background, I've practiced criminal defense since 2008. I was a public defender in this very circuit. I handled felony um, offenses for all of my career as a public defender. And I can tell you with great certainty that regardless of when we ask this question, there will always be people who are languishing in pretrial detention who may lawfully be there, but should not be there. 
So the predicate question, right, how do, how do we determine what that should is? At the Southern Center and in our activist community, our advocacy community, we define should by principles of fairness, principles of justice, principles that actually seek to deliver the promises of the Constitution, which are disproportionately denied to black people, brown people, and poor people in this country. Georgia is number one for correctional control. If Georgia was a country, we would even outpace most other nations when it comes to the number of people in jails and prison. And on top of that, um, our system of free child detention is an anomaly across the world. So who is it in our jail today that you believe should not be there? Uh, people who are there for drug possession should not be, well, let me start here. We don't believe that pre-child detention in most cases is just at the Southern Center for Human Rights. It is an anomaly across the world, right? But when we look at the number of people who are there for non-complex felonies, who are there for simple possession of drugs, people who are there because of crimes of poverty, people who are there because they have unmet behavioral health needs, because they have unmet um, substance use needs, problematic substance use needs. I can say that I, don't, had not, I did not have many clients whose interests were served by languishing at Rice Street. Um, and, and so that's where we come down there. And the, uh, Sheriff Labatt has given a report of the actual numbers and the data, but there are hundreds of people in that jail who could be better served in community. Just so I can get a response to this, uh, very specifically, if you had to give the most obvious example to somebody, obviously we, we, can, we can have debates on some of the, the, the um, categories you mentioned. But the obvious example, this person should not be at uh, the Fulton County Jail. Give me the one archetype and then I want to pivot. Well, so we had a parent to come to us who had a son, who has a son, who was at the Fulton County Jail, uh, had been there in pre-child detention for quite a long time. I forget what the offense was, uh, but was awaiting treatment. Um, at some point, the person's case was dismissed, right? without that person receiving the treatment, they were released and then found themselves back in the Fulton County Jail for a subsequent offense also related to behavioral health problems. And so um, there are people who only find um, the attention of our government when the substance abuse or behavioral health problems that they have lead them into the crosshairs of the criminal legal system. I'm not suggesting that's the majority of the people, but that's certainly, I think, a person that all of us can be sympathetic to. Yeah. And there are models for the delivery of services to people um, that would prevent them from having to be in a jail bed, sure. right, and traumatized by pre-child detention, and then readmitted to a jail bed because they never received the care that they needed. Got it. Judge Dunway, uh, give me, you, you did raise your hand. Um, so that means that you believe that there are people within the current facility that should not be there. What is an example, who is an example of an individual that should not be in the Fulton County Jail System today? Well, I, I didn't raise my hand. I guess I should give that disclaimer. There are a lot of things that, um, because cases, uh, the cases may come before me that I'm not allowed to give an opinion on. Of course, I have a personal opinion um, it's coming from Atlanta and being raised in the AUC, um, but a, a legal opinion on who should be in the jail and who is not in the jail, I might have to make that determination. And my role is to make it on a case by case basis. So that's why I did not raise my hand. But are there people in the, as a judge, are there people in that facility who have not seen a judge yet? I don't know, but I believe there are. I believe there are uh, people you know, arrested. They're supposed to see someone within 72 hours. Um, so, you know, someone arrested tonight, they haven't seen a judge. Um, but they should see a judge within 72 hours. Then they should have a preliminary hearing. And then there's, if they're still in jail, there's 90 days to get them indicted. Um, so there has to be people who are arrested that haven't seen. So one more point of clarification, and then I'll, I'll turn to you, uh, Sheriff Lott. You were saying that uh, if someone is arrested tonight, they're put into the, the facility, up to 72 hours. Oh, do, does every single person see a judge within 72 hours? Every single person should. I don't know. Oh, should. We're going to have to should. I don't know if they all do. Okay. I'm, I'm not got got judge they see. Got it. Okay. They come to me once they live in Okay. So let me turn it to you, Sheriff Lott. I want to very specifically answer this question, and then we can get into other pieces of it. But are there people within the facility tonight who have been there for over 72 hours? So, so back to 
way individuals are brought in. So first, uh, and I don't know if we skipped over Judge Kirk by mistake, uh, but our chief judge managed the court uh, and the state court in, in terms of the program that she's put in place, very good program. Everyone comes in, gets an electronic bond. And in that case, that helps us avoid uh, Riverside violations, et cetera. But then the next day, individuals go to court. And so anybody that we find that has not been to court, we make sure they get to court. So I'm confident to say 99.99% of the people that are currently there today have been to court. Now, let me go a little further. Part of, in answering the question, are there people that should be or should not be in jail, you have to quantify that. And what I mean is there are potentially the 3,500 people, right? Yep. That means there are potentially 3,500 victims. So I have a dual responsibility. Now one of the things when I first got elected, when I came in, one of the things I wanted to know was, based on my conversation with, with Chief Judge Kerr and, and others, is how many people have been there longer than a year that have not gone back to see a judge, right? And that number was astounding. But it was also as we were coming into and trying to come out of COVID, right? So there's some things with the 90-day rules that Chief Judge at the time uh, put in place that extended that for the DA, et cetera. So it depends on what, what lens you look through as, as how best to answer. Got it. So just a, a, another uh, follow-up to that. I, I, a lot of the argument around, okay, we, we have a jail facility. Um, you're saying that vast majority of people get in front of a judge in the time frame that they're supposed to. Uh, but there are folks who are in that facility for uh, potentially violating probation, or at least we think they violated uh, probation. There could be people who are there for being late on a child care payment. Um, are there, when you think about the folks who are actually in the facility itself, are there people who, based on your, your, your uh, looking at it, that just don't need to be there? That there's a, uh, that, that doesn't make sense for them to be in that facility, there might be another or better way. And so there are opportunities to to acquiesce and make that happen, right? Yep. What does that look like? Yep. So, but that's not on the sheriff, and that's not on the county jail. Sure. That is on the judges, right, who hear the cases to make those case-by-case -case decisions, and that is on the process. Systemically, Fulton County has a, a crippled process, right, in and of itself. So across the country where jail populations are going down, it is not because of any activism, it is because of the way the system is, people matriculate through the system. And so to that extent, there are opportunities, which we have invited numbers of people in, including working with the Bell Project, right? Trying to figure out how we get individuals that qualify to get out. Yeah. But violent crimes, this notion that, and I've heard it and, you know, repeatedly, and we've had some healthy conversations around it, that there's 600 misdemeanors in jail and the sheriff should just let them go, right? It's not the case. And so, so what is the case? So the case is that 200, as of last week, 261 misdemeanors, right? Those 261 out of 3,500 are misdemeanors. And so, and, and Alton can quote the numbers even better than I. Okay. Here is the problem. Our system of how we book people in is broken. And okay, and, agreed and, on that. And let me define broken for, for the audience, you and audience. 55 percent of those individuals have additional warrants, have additional charges. So if I book somebody in, my dad entry uh, in person technician puts them in the misdemeanor first and then the felonies. When we when you draw down on that information, it shows the misdemeanor. Right? So when you go back, and this is why uh, last week we gave all of that being completely transparent, you look at that 55% of those folks so have additional charges. Pull so in, about half. So you flip a coin, they may or may not. So pulling the data from that between the judges that have had an opportunity to yeah. see. Uh, more in depth in, in terms of those particular cases. There were 21 people that had been sentenced and ready to be released in September. So that, that was captured. And then there are a number of individuals who, who have the mental health evaluations that we're waiting on, 
right? So we can teach. They're just sitting there because we're waiting on it. We wait on, uh, wait on mental health evaluations. If we work, great. If we work with him. If we yeah. work with anybody that's willing to get the information. Is the best place for them to be is in this facility? Is the facility prepared to, to hold someone who is waiting on a mental health so evaluation? My team does an excellent job of caring for those individuals. But just short staffed, right? As uh, best we can, right? And that is just where we are in the process. But again, the jails across the country have become mental health institutions because we have traditionally a last- I, I can't speak to the jails across the country. What I, I really want to focus on here is in Fulton County, what you what you did agree to on the on the panel, and I want to turn it over to Saba uh, for, for some questions for some of our other panelists, is you did agree that there's overcrowding at the jail. We agree with that, correct? Right. So we agree with that. So the question is, is that if there is overcrowding, who is it that, uh, is it any, do, do you have a system in which who gets a bed, and who doesn't get a bed? Is there a, uh, how are you determining uh, when someone goes into the facility, what kind of care that they receive or not. So based on the judge's evaluation, those kinds of things, here's the important number, is that there are 526 people as of 245 today sleeping on floor device. 526 people. So as individuals, as cases get, get churned, or as individuals make bond, we try and get those individuals. Are any of those 526 folks uh, fitting the description of violent offender, like people who would pose a risk to society. Absolutely. Like Absolutely. Okay. They pose a risk inside my facility. Okay. All right. So the last last part of my, my question is around bond. Um, and uh, Eric, if there's something you want to chime in on that, feel free, and then we're going to turn it over to, to me and Robin as well. Uh, the, there are, we, we have seen campaigns and, and, uh, and, and efforts to get people out of jail because they just purely cannot afford the bond. Um, so a bond is usually some sort of assessment on high, how high risk they are going to be uh, if they are released, what that dollar number is, but it's not meant to criminalize somebody or to punish somebody if they don't have enough money uh, to afford the bond. But we heard that there are people, and you correct me if I'm wrong if my data is off, there are people in the facility who are waiting on a one dollar bond or a really low dollar number bond. Are there any, just, just so I can frame the question, which is, is there anybody inside of the facility, do we have folks inside of the facility who are not a threat to society and yet just cannot afford bond and cannot be uh, bailed out of jail? So let me refute the whole dollar piece, right? All right. If we can collect that information if, if that is something that uh, you were interested in. Yeah, we're going to talk about data in a second. Right. Yeah. From that perspective, but that's not my decision. Right? That's better suited for the judges. So understanding that everyone sees a judge. Yes. Right. That's their. That's their. That's their. Agreed. Way, I'm not. Right? I'm not questioning right. the actual decision or how we got to bond determination. Right. Obviously, that's a. That's, we're going to have to get to the statute. What was it say? Was it not say? But what you know is uh, because you know the data better than I do. Inside of the facility, are there people who are being held on a low dollar bond and are not able to post uh, because of it that are non violent offenders? Let's, let's approach it from this perspective. Okay. The judge, again, can answer better than I can. Okay. So, an individual with no bond goes to court. Yeah. Several months go by, they go back to the judge. Okay. The judge says, whether you're indigent or not, they go through that process and they give them a bond. Okay. They may not make that bond. They go back to court. And the judge is then able to adjust the bond accordingly, and repeat, re repeat, rinse and repeat until that per until that person or that judge makes that decision, right? And again, to judge's point, it is a case by case basis. Where does bond data sit? Who holds this bond data? Because I can't find actual bond data. Bond data, as in what? Is like what people are being held on? What? How much it would cost to get them out? Like who? who is it the sheriff's office that holds it? Is it the courts that hold it? Who holds this so data? So from a data perspective in terms, of, so what we were asked through this committee was to do an average, right? Just try and figure out that piece. Okay. But again, that's a case by case basis. Each bond, it's in the system, right? We can tell you what the bonds are. Yep. And if you want to point a range to whether it be a dollar to $500, you know, 501 to 1,000, whatever that looks like, but that in and of itself, we're completely transparent about. 
And so that may not get to the crux of the issue, though, which is what I'm hearing, is that people are in jail because of bail. Because they can't afford to get out. Is right. that true? And again, but again, you would have to balance that with, I can't afford to get out, but I can get $500 worth of Yeah, yeah, but that's a different, I, all I'm trying to figure out is, are there people, because I'm trying to get to solution building, are there people right. inside of this facility who cannot afford so to get out? So we do not collect indigent data in that capacity. But that's what the judges, and again, I don't throw judges you know, into this, but that's part of what their job is. Yep. And so, Judge, I'd have to rely on you. Sure. Thank you. Okay. Got it. All right. Um, so, one line procedure, if I may. One line procedure, someone comes um, before the court, they or their lawyer files a motion for bond to get them before the court. They come before the court. Um, they made their argument for a bond. Um, the state usually, many times, I would say, for many times, objects. The DA's office many times objects to bond being given. Um, so the decision comes to the court. And here are the factors that we have to consider in whether or not to grant bond. The first factor I always consider is the person standing before me, as you pointed out, is presumed innocent. They have not been convicted of a thing. So why am I keeping this innocent person in jail? There are four reasons to keep someone who is presumed innocent in jail. Number one, they are a risk of flight. If I let you out on bond, no matter how much the bond is, you won't come back to court. Number two, are you a risk to commit further felonies pending bond? If you have a rap sheet with five prior felonies on it, do I give you a bond on felony number six? Number three, are you a risk or danger to the victim or other witnesses, risk to threaten or danger to the victims or other witnesses in the case? If it's a domestic violence case, if I let you out on a domestic violence case, am I going to be on the news for letting you out because you went and killed um, the alleged victim of the domestic violence case? And then finally, number four is are you a risk or threat or danger to the community as a whole? So those are the four factors that I have to weigh, and I, I say I, but all judges should weigh um, in granting bond with that umbrella of as an innocent person, presumed innocent person in front of me, why do I keep that innocent person in jail? So I want to pick up with something you just said, Judge. We mentioned briefly about a, a jail population review committee. Is bond is the bond conversation part of that? And if it is, just give us a little bit more context of what that conversation is looking like so far. So I may not be the person to answer that about the jail population review committee. Um, the Superior Court judges, we are state employees. We are not county employees. Um, we have a, a part of our budget comes from the county, but we are state elected officials. So we're not county employees, so we shouldn't be a part of those county and city um, government uh, decisions. So I'm probably not the person to answer that question. Yeah. No. Robin and Alan are both on that, on that committee. You can pass over the mic. Thank you. So I'll, I'll just give us an understanding of the of this review committee. Where are you tasked with? Who are some of the players who are part of it? And what are you all hoping to achieve? So, that's a lot. That's a lot. Um, but, but if I can, I'd like to ask the first question that I didn't if you ask everyone about, if I can. Well, I didn't ask everyone. Day. If you can okay. answer the question she has. Okay, well, I just feel like we didn't answer it, uh, at least to this, in, in a comprehensive way. But uh, the jail policy board was set up um, to uh, to, to manage the diversion center that's being built in the current uh, location of ACDC that was set up a year ago. Um, when uh, we went forward and asked the city of Atlanta to let Fulton County have 700 beds because we consider it a humanitarian crisis, we consider it unconscionable that you have 1,300 empty beds while well, we have individuals whose lives are at risk because we are, have a jail that's overcrowded. The city council passed that, and the board of commissioners passed that. 
they did say to the Justice Policy Board, we would like you to do a statistical, maybe provide a statistical report in advance of that. That particular caveat was put in at the last minute. Um, and so the Justice Policy Board, as part of that, set up a review committee that is designed to produce a report. What that report should include and what it shouldn't include wasn't defined in that particular piece of legislation. So the scope of that is in fact being defined by the Justice Policy Board and primarily by the, um, the, the, the co-CEOs or whatever you want to call them of the Justice Policy Board. My understanding is that the goal is to provide an overview of who is in jail, right? What the charges are, how long they have been there, right? Some demographics, age, and so on. The sheriff delivered that information to the city council and to the board of commissioners last week. So my understanding is that's what this review committee is supposed to be doing. And in fact, as far as the Fulton County uh, perspective, that has in fact been done and has been delivered to the city council and to the board of commissioners. So there aren't specific recommendations? There's no recommendations. That wasn't the ask. The ask was, was for a statistical review of who is in the jail. There wasn't an ask for recommendations on anything. And in fact, if you look at the language for the Justice Policy Board, the language is very clear. Their role is to make sure that the version center is actually implemented. That was the scope. This particular ask was added as part of the decision as a precursor to allowing the sheriff to move the individuals to the CDC. Tiffany and Robin both have something they'd like to add. Yes, so, oh, would you like to go ahead, Tiffany, and I'll go after Tiffany. So I have the language, so the, the language, thank you, the language of the ordinance says the report shall detail a review to be conducted which shall include a statistical analysis of the jail populations of the city of Atlanta and Fulton County, which would include, but not be limited to, an analysis of data related to the total populations, the offenses which detainees are booked under, the average length of detention, the average bond issued per violation, the reasons for the detainee releases, and the frequency of the charging, the frequency of the charging of each offense. Now, you know, I'm an attorney, and some really critical words here are to include but not be limited to. I think that it's important to know that while Sheriff Labatt has provided a report, to city council and the commission uh, that the report uh, was the sheriff's analysis and was not raw data. And anybody who deals with, with data analysis understands the importance of the opportunity to review raw data. And in the jail policy board, or the jail review committee rather, um, also can serve a very important purpose. Transparency is a critical feature to any democracy. And affording communities an opportunity to look at raw data for themselves is valuable. Um, anytime that we request open records from the county or the city, anywhere in Georgia, Alabama, or Louisiana, we ask for raw data. Now, the Southern Center has filed several open records requests for the electronic transmission of certain data related to the jail. I and I think that it is valuable that Sheriff Labatt and the consultants have delivered a report on behalf of the Sheriff's Department. But checks and balances require other eyes and the opportunity for other analysis. And if the purpose of the report uh, is to jumpstart that, then fine. But we should not, we, we shouldn't sit here and pretend as though amendments to legislation that is being voted on by legislative bodies are not often introduced during those legislative meetings. That is typical. So there's nothing underhanded, there's nothing sneaky about it, and this is a really valuable opportunity for the county and the city to also show the community other service providers, right, how they can be helpful in getting the jail population down, even when the 700 people are transferred. There should be a desire to ensure that no one is in that jail who could be better served elsewhere, and the analysis that this committee could do could make that more possible. Can we get votes from Robin, and then the sheriff, and then Alton? 
Um, just piggybacking off of what Tiffany said with the check and balances of who's on this jail um, review committee, uh, we have people that are organizers, but we also have people who are in favor of this lease. Uh, we have judges, we have people that do know the data. Uh, we did fight for this to be a check and balance procedure because by some, it wanted to be one sided. We wanted to have data people who did not want to take in the humanistic part of this data. Um, and just to let you know and go back on your question you asked earlier, we do have dollar bills inside the jail. And I know that because we bond them out. Uh, we get them very, very often from people at Bull County and give us names, and, and we, get, we get them out of jail. Um, so that does exist, and that does show you that people cannot get out of jail because of poverty. And you know, it's not that people are sitting in jail because they don't want to get out or because there's um, people that's having high bonds. There are people who want dollar bills. Um, and another thing I want to address that Sheriff Abbott said um, is that across the country, how that people um, are not doing anything different to bring out the population, um, I can tell you that's not true. We had uh, people that went to different cities, such as Houston, and also inside of Arizona, to look at their diversion programs of populations where the jail no longer has the high overcrowded uh, people that are inside the jails, and they went to see how the diversion programs work. Um, so for example, in Arizona, they have a, a task squad that goes out when somebody has a mental health, and they do not go to jail. They do not sit in the jail. They have other services that they receive. Okay, in the interest of time, if you all could just please focus on a question that is being asked in that moment. Well, I'm not going to have anybody sit here and talk me a lie. Right? Mm -hmm. here, here is where we $26 are. $26.30. Here, here's where we are. Here's where we are. I am pro diversionary programs. Every last one. Of them. What you just said was a, a squad goes out, makes an assessment before an individual is arrested. Right? Not after they're arrested. Right? So let's do that. Right? You fund it, let's figure out how to do it. Right? From that perspective. I'm on board. But understand that there are 3,530 people that are already arrested. Right? And judges have to make a decision. And that decision may be part of a diversionary program that the DA agrees with. I agree with you, right, in that aspect. But from that perspective, to be able to understand, raw data is raw data. That's every data point we have on an individual is raw data. I'm not a statistician, but I know I'm transparent. And so all 3,530 individuals, all the information that was asked for based on that legislation was provided, full stop. Here is the problem we have. Most of the individuals that don't want this to occur, don't want people off of the floor and treated like they're human, it's one way or the other. What I have said constantly is, we can do both. Get people off the floor, treat them like they're human, simultaneously go through the data and help us, right? as a system, figure out what that looks like. Because you can go through the data, you as an attorney can take it to a judge, and the judge can make a decision. The inequitable part is the amount of people that we have in jail that don't have representation. And then co-defendants, and I learned this over the last couple of weeks, and judge can help me with this. We have co-defendants that if the public defender's office accepts a case, the remaining co-defendants on that case cannot be helped by the public defender's office. We wrote that advocacy letter. And, that's a, a, and, a, and we're on the same page, Absolutely. right? But don't blame the sheriff's office, right? We're going to continue to push. We're an office, not department, let me be clear. We're going to continue to push to do the right thing. Providing the data was the right thing. But what the commission then come back, or, or the commission then want to create a committee to then go study, it's a death by a thousand cuts. And then to come back and say, and this was in writing, that we might not have any, or we will have the data in November, November 18th. 
Why not move these individuals, get them off the floor, treat them like they're human, and if there's somebody that needs to be released, they can be released from 236 P Street. But aren't they being released from Union City first? So your first transfers will be from the South Carolina. No, no, no. Let's, well, well, let me, well, again, right? Finish his comment. Right. And, and so to that point, and I certainly will address that as well, but it's, it, there is no reason on the, it, it doesn't make good walking around sense not to get the people off the floor and to address the overcrowding and to address those that can get out with proper defense. Just one quick question before we turn it to Tiffany to respond. You, you said all of the data that was enumerated by what Tiffany uh, outlined there has been provided. As one of the uh, enumerated points you brought up was bond data. Was bond data provided? We, we give you a copy of it. It, the answer is yes. We'll, we'll give you a copy of it. So everyone's bond is on there, right? Everything that was asked. Now, the way it was asked for was an average per charge, et cetera. So to that extent, that is a different set of data. But if John Doe was charged with simple battery and the judge gave him a bond, it's on there. But you, so you have the raw data on, uh, on, bond, like on bond data. Uh, because the reason why I'm asking is, surely if we understand a little bit more about the bond data, we could start to address overcrowding in that way. Um, if we understood more about who was on a bond for less than $500 versus more than $500, overcrowding, we're talking about 500 or so people, there may be quite a few folks over there that if we had better information on how much they need in order to be bonded out, we might be able to make some better decisions. That might be data that would be relevant. No? Well, we'll certainly give you the data. That's not the point. What's relevant is what you determine. And, and what I mean by that is the bail bond, the bail project itself, $5,000 and below. Again, the Public Defender's Office has their hands full, and they're continuing to churn through and try to make those bonds, right? And again, you still have to qualify. So when you have even the Public Defender's Office that is willing to make those bonds, they still have a certain level of criteria on that individual coming back to make to to court. So again, that is not where we are. We agree. But the county and the city aren't using necessarily that data on bonds to make decisions that's on again, what to do bonds that. fall on the judges, right? We don't make people's bonds. And the last question on that is that the, the policy uh, review board that is there, you know, you said you're not a statistician. The the, the head of that review board is a statistician. There are 10 people from Fulton County on the policy review board. Um, there are two people from the sheriff's office on the policy review board. Why not defer to, why, why aren't they the perfect and, and I'm place? And they're not the person, perfect placeholders to do that. I'm saying let's move the individuals in the meantime because the data is just the data. The humanistic crisis we're in, getting people off the floor should take precedence. The data can tell us who. But, they, but they're not giving us the data until November 18th. Got it. In okay. the meantime, move on. Let me, uh, let me make sure we get Tiffany in. I think that was it. Thank you. So um, uh, just a couple of points. Uh, the Southern Center for Human Rights is one of the organizations responsible for drafting and passing the Georgia Independent Defense Act. Uh, we have for decades served on all of the boards that service people who do not, uh, who are indigent and therefore cannot hire counsel. We wrote one of the advocacy letters related to the CP crisis in Fulton County. We uh, have filed most of the lawsuits, or many of the lawsuits against Fulton County over the course of decades for the mistreatment of people in Fulton County facilities as recently as our, our lawsuit against Fulton County uh, because of the treatment of women in the Fulton County South, the South Fulton Annex. Um, we are humanitarians. Uh, in name, and we are humanitarians indeed. Um, we are close partners with the Bell Project. In fact, when 2020, during the COVID-19 crisis, we worked with the Bell Project and tried to do a mass release from Fulton County. Uh, that mass release couldn't happen because the county would not accept one large check for the number of people we wanted to bail out. We are in constant conversations with the Bell Project and the information we inquired with them about whether they had any ongoing programming with the sheriff, uh, any long-term planning with the sheriff, they, they confirm that they do work with Fulton County to bail out people on a case-by-case -case basis. 
but that is not a long-term, right, ongoing plan. There are so many people and organizations in this city who do not wish to have an antagonist relationship with the county. We work with people on all sides of the aisle. At the state capitol, many of the people that people rally against because of the color of their logo for their political party, we are able to pass good laws with them as well. And so what I'm saying that to say, we come to the table ready to collaborate regardless of political party, regardless of who you went to high school with, it does not matter. What we know is that in our conversations with public defenders, a couple of things are happening. People are seen within 72 hours for first appearance, but then people are being held for 180 days sometimes between bond hearings. Um, there are people who have gone in to observe, and when someone shows up, so the C3s are a really bad case of that, you show up, you don't have an attorney assigned, a judge, because of capacity, may not be able to get you on another calendar for months. When I was a public defender, I would say, Judge, can I have a two-week reset? Can I have a one-week reset? Those kinds of things are not possible right now under COVID uh, because of the backlog. And so we have to be really, um, we have to be willing to consider that we should think about whether our processes are working. A 180-day reset for a bond hearing is what we talk about having to deal with in South Georgia, where they got two magistrates and a little bitty jail. That's not what Fulton County has under the ORCA program, under Project ORCA. Um, we have gotten some reports from public defenders that misdemeanors um, and some low-level felonies are receiving priority for hearings for people who are not currently incarcerated. Prioritizing people who are out on bond through Project ORCA only serves to ensure that more people remain in Fulton County detention facilities. Now, um, I am not offering anecdotes to support a larger premise. But what I'm saying is if we are not having these conversations, then we are not, um, we don't have a, a really accurate picture of the processes that are holding people in jail longer than they should be because they're not able to come before judicial actors. And that's a process problem. Okay, so we're gonna move on and also Mr. CEO, I want you to help us understand the IGA between Fulton County and the city of Atlanta as it pertains to Atlanta City Detention Center. So just give us a very high level overview of the IGA. What was some of the data that went into how you wrote the IGA? Uh, and then give us some timelines as well. Okay, the, uh, <clears throat> the IGA has, a, I guess I'm talking the core components. One is the number of individuals who uh, were going to, hold it closer. I'm sorry, the number of individuals who um, we would be able to move into the ACDC. That number is 700 uh, individuals. Um, the IGA itself, uh, the, the, the term is four years. Um, the, the cost is uh, is fifty dollars a day per uh, per detainee. And how does that cost compare to other jurisdictions that are holding Fulton County detainees? Uh, we have uh, I think the cost at, at, at Cobb is uh, is eighty dollars. The, there is a, a, a significant difference in that. At Cobb County, they are providing the correction officers. Uh, as part of that, um, at, at the ACDC, we will be providing the correction officers. We will be providing the medical staff. We will be, we will be providing the food. We will be providing the laundry. So think of it as more of a turnkey, uh, where we are basically having uh, access to the facility as opposed to uh, Cobb County, which is much more sort of comprehensive, where they are providing those range of services. And would, this might be a question for the sheriff, but is there currently enough staff, Fulton County SO staff, to actually handle the ACDC jail? He knows that. Well, well <laughs> I mean, the, the, first of all, there is a staff shortage of correction officers across the country. And, uh, and so the plan is to uh, initially move uh, the, uh, the women from Union City, and over a period of time, uh, to move the men. I think we had targeted 100 individuals per month. And so one of the constraints, one of the things we're going to have to plan as we think about who should be moved, because that will have to be part of the way you look at the classification of those individuals, is how do you move them in a way that optimizes the staff that you, in fact, have available at the time. Concurrent with that, however, we're going to be aggressively pursuing an increase to, to increase our 
our uh, correctional uh, staff. We have a number of programs underway to not only attract but also retain those individuals as we move forward because we need to do that as a matter of course in terms of the way uh, the sheriff runs the operation. And then a timeline. Timeline, as soon as we can get the, I mean, look, if I can, right, and I, I'm going to reiterate what the sheriff said. This thing has been positioned as it's either one or the other. We can do, and by the way, I'm not a lawyer, but I am a statistician and a trained econometrician. Okay, so I do not know numbers. And when it comes to transparency, I will also offer that you look at the Fulton County website. Because when you look at that website, you see statistics and data on the system that I would argue is unparalleled for, for any other county in the country. Because when we went to look and see what should we be publishing, right, in terms of performance on the system, we couldn't find any other county in the U.S. that had the kind of data that we had. So I agree with you. Transparency is very important. Data is very important. We're happy to provide that data as part of this process. But as the sheriff said, every single day we have correction officers, we have medical care folks who walk into that jail and whose lives are at risk because we are overcrowded. And we fundamentally believe that they should, we should be moving people as quickly as possible while we go through the process and they should be concurrent rather than consecutive. So today's September 27th, I had to double check. If it's September 27th, at what point will we see Fulton County detainees in the ACDC? Well, next week, the city council meets, and at that point in time, they can decide to accept this information as meeting the spirit, as well as the letter of what was required. And if they do so, and they agree, and the sheriff needs to move people on Wednesday morning. I think, Sheriff, I don't want to speak. Yeah, I think that's what you told me. I'm moving the same day. Uh, right. uh, just a, a couple questions on that. First, what you just said, the first folks who would come over would be from Union City, correct? So it wouldn't be Fulton County folks first, right? Those are our. You no, no, I mean, I'm saying from, from the facility that is overcrowded today, the overcrowding issue would still remain because we would start moving. You also see it's City. overcrowded as well. Okay, so you would start with Union City is overcrowded, you're saying? It's so Union, Union City is overcrowded. Okay, what's the problem? The city what's also asked that the women come first in part of the negotiations, right? Okay. So that we could then staff because they do not have the staff. Okay. And then ultimately we can assess, we can continuously assess and then open units individually up to 100 a month. Okay, so 100 folks a month, so 700 beds, that means up to seven, in seven months or so, we're gonna have a full uh, uh, facility at ACDC. Four months. You move the women, right. day one, that's okay. 350, right. 100. You're moving all 350 oh, from Union City? Correct. Okay, correct. and so Union City, what's happening with that? There, was, there were some, some inhumane conditions down there which you helped solve before I became chair, yeah. right? So continuing in that vein, we want to make sure that we provide the most humane. And so what's happening with the Union City facility? So is that, that shutting we, down? We, well, it won't be mothballed. We will continue. I will continue to ask the county commission just in case, right? i got to have a plan B in case there are other programs we can put out at Union City, but we can repair Union City. Okay. We're, we're Union City is in near of, it's in disrepair as well. So then would you move the folks who are at ACDC back to Union City? Only if we couldn't get a new jail built inside four years. Well, part of what I'm, I'm asking, right, I, my, my sister has a shopping problem, right? So when I, uh, we, when I went home recently uh, to my parents' place, uh, my mom said, look, you got to clear out your, your closet. you got way too many clothes everywhere. So she was like, I know I can do that. What I need is my brother's room, and I'm going to put all the clothes in my brother's room, and I'll be able to clean, look at what's going on, and I'll be able to consolidate and, and get rid of some stuff. Instead, now my room has become her closet, and she's now moving to uh, my parents' room. The part of the question I'm, I'm wondering is, are we, uh, to use Pat's description, are we really turning off the faucet here, or are we just trying to build a bigger bathtub? Like, what is the, are, is this a real estate problem? Is this a, we need facilities now, or are there opportunities, if real estate was not the issue, are there opportunities to reduce that overcrowding population without having to rely solely on spreading people through multiple facilities? Can so, I, can I, if I can. Yeah, sure. 
I think part of this is understanding how we got here. Before COVID, we had 1,200 less people in our jail. Okay? It wasn't perfect, right? We were overcrowded, but we didn't have a crisis. Did we not have a crisis in 2002 or 2000? I'm talking about, I'm just, I'm just talking about black No, no, I'm genuinely asking. No, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm trying to address your, your point, which is, okay. what I'm trying to say is, before COVID, uh -huh. we had overcrowding, but it wasn't a crisis stage. Okay. We've added 1,200 individuals since that time over the last two years, combination of things. Yes. We had to shut down the system, right? We couldn't have jury trials, we couldn't assemble jurors. We had an increase in bookings, 14% over the last year because of increase in crime. And the nature of the crimes have become more severe, which lengthens the time, right, to actually go through the trial process. So, to answer your question, part of what we're doing, and that's part of what ORCA is designed to do, is to help us accelerate and get people out of the system. So our goal, our target, is that to your question, three or four years from now, we don't intend to have 3,500 people in our system because we will have, in fact, been able to clear a number of those cases and ideally, ideally get back to where we were at a minimum pre-COVID. So, yes, we will have, we will still have a situation, but it, it's not, it, it won't be 3,500 individuals. Okay. So what, you, what you're saying then is that um, essentially here, you're saying that this is a temporary solution um, and that after four years. If, if all things were to remain stagnant, that this facility could go back to being the, uh, the mental health and, and uh, community services facility it was intended to be? Well, this is never designed to, in fact, replace or get in the way of that. And that's part of the false narrative. We support diversion, right? We, we, we have a number of diversion things at the county that haven't even been talked about. Our solicitor has diversion. Judge Kirk has diversion services, yes. right? We offer a number of services. We also haven't talked about a number of the programs the sheriff runs, so that when people re-enter, they don't, there is no recidivism, which is one of the issues. Honest, I'm honest, I'm genuine, I'm, I'm not the subject matter expert. Okay, I understand that, right? But, so uh, here's, my, here's my genuine question. Okay. As a, as a resident, as a voter, as someone who just sits back, here's what I've heard today. I've heard that we have a jail that is overcrowded. Yes. I've heard that there are opportunities for people who are there in that jail right now that don't necessarily need to be there. Maybe it's because of the law, maybe it's because of the code, maybe it's because of all sorts of other things that could get people off of the, off of the floors of that jail that are not necessarily just transferring them somewhere else, but there are diversion things that we can do right now for people who are sitting on the, on the floors of these jails that would solve the humanitarian crisis. Is that not the That's case? That's incorrect. Okay, so there's no way for us to solve this without having another facility. But here again, you're, I, that's you're, what I'm trying to understand. That, as a that, 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 that the individuals in our jail today. Right? First of all, let me, let me tell you what we agree with. Okay, agree, John. Because we here again, we focus on what we don't. We don't. We, we don't focus on what we agree. I agree, right? And I, I'm on record saying this: the state of Georgia is either number one, number two, or number three in terms of the percentage of people behind bars as a percentage of the overall population. Fulton County benchmarks against 11 other other counties, right? And there's only one other county that is a percentage of the population that has more people behind bars. We have too many people behind bars, period. We all agree on that, right? There's no disagreement, right? And we ought to change the system. But what we are saying to you is that system has made, has put too many people behind bars at Fulton County, and we need to take a humanitarian approach to see what we can do to help them. Now, I also will say to you, that more than a thousand individuals in our jail are on some kind of psychotropic medication and need help, right? We are one of the largest psychiatric hospitals in the state. And your question, is this the best place to, to, to help them? Absolutely not, right? But Georgia Regional has 200 beds. We have built more prison beds in this state than we built psychiatric beds, right? We have a mental health problem. And we are part of that, the jail is part of that microcosm. So would we like to have those individuals be treated somewhere else? Absolutely. Absolutely. So maybe this is a question for Tiffany and Robin, and maybe you two also, Alton. I think everyone agrees and recognizes that there is a mental health issue in our state and our country, right? So if we recognize that, and we're spending time to do a study review panel on the jail population and 
we've got a number of different organizations represented here tonight, who is tackling the other part of the problem, which is the mental health component? And what is the role of a sheriff's office, a county, a city, a mayor, in actually doing something to address that particular problem? Why don't we start with you, Robin? Okay. Well, just to reiterate what you're saying, um, being have been in prison, and prison and jails have now become places where people live in their concerns. Um, so the only thing that we feel like is that we have to offer services, which we have had. Had is very influential in helping people that need to be diverted. Um, because going and sitting inside of the jail when you have a mental health um, problem or issue is not going to solve the solution. It makes the problem worse. That's when you have incidents that happen within your jail. Because people are sitting there with no services, no help, um, and being a part of someone who was inside of, you know, of, inside of the jail, inside of the prison, inside the same jail that I was in the jail back in 2010, people were on the floor then. Um, so I was one of the ones that were on the floor. So for this to not sound like we do not want people off the floor, that's not true. But you know what you're saying about mental health is that when people get help, real help, it's not going to be inside of the jail. You cannot get help inside of a jail. For someone to go and get and see someone for an hour or so, and then go back into this environment with contention and aggravation, it's not going to help them. So that's why we say, if you have services like PAD, who they don't even go inside of a jail in the first place and get services. So, so what do you better. want the county, whether it's the sheriff's office or the county itself, what do you want them to do? to address the mental health component of this conversation? It's to implement PAD more. They, we have a system where you can either call 311 or people that call 911. Have PAD, we have responded more. Tiffany, you want to add to that? And then I'm going to pose the same question back to you, Alton and Sheriff. So I think that um, one important point is well, we've traveled um, to other cities and looked at the delivery of services for people with behavioral health needs um, and behavioral health needs. The resource mapping part has been very important. And what we see is that despite um, Atlanta and Fulton County being places where there are significant financial resources in a lot of places, when compared to other similar cities, we are actually resource poor when it comes to treatment beds and treatment facilities. Um, and on top of that, the Department of Corrections uh, the State Department of Corrections has ceased its operation of many of the, of the uh, mental health treatment options available to people who are actually convicted and sentenced. And so one thing I want to be really transparent about is there are not currently enough services um, for people who would, find, who would otherwise find themselves in the, in the criminal legal system, which is why organizations like Women on the Rise have championed pouring more resources into um, repurposing the Atlanta City Detention Center, right? We, we know that we have to provide avenues for uh, community organizations that, that are direct services providers to service people who are justice impacted, but also fund them. Um, and, so, and that so what do you happen. want, what would you want the sheriff or the county to do to address the mental health component of this conversation? I don't believe that the sheriff can do more to address the mental health concerns in correctional facilities. What we find is people are people decompensate when they are incarcerated. And so what we are asking is for the county to partner with community organizations and direct services providers so that we can provide um, we can provide more robust delivery of services. There was recent legislation, um, House Bill 1013, and in, in the General Assembly, where um, the, the, the legislature is looking at how to ensure that people have access, but also that more programs can be funded. So I just I, what, what I'm trying to avoid is misrepresenting what's currently possible, so that we can so we can be super clear that what community organizations are also saying is we must build more to deliver services. Okay, and so again, the same question both to Sheriff Labatt and then also to Alton. Sheriff, what do you want? What do you want community organizations to do? What do you want the city of Atlanta to do? Because so many of the detainees in Fulton are coming from the city of Atlanta. And what would you want the state to do? So those three activists, the state, and the city. So first, we have to understand my constitutional responsibility. 
chief law enforcement in the county. And we have 15 municipalities in South Fulton County, the largest in the state, uh, protect the courts and, of course, run the facility, run, run the jail. And so to that extent, the question becomes, and, and I want to make sure we're clear, again, pro pre arrest diversion, but it is just that. It's not time when you get to the back door to make that decision. An officer has already made a decision, right? In many instances, if there are opportunities to intervene, here's the problem, whether it be funding or otherwise. I've had officers tell me, I call 311 at 2 o'clock in the morning. And nobody answers, right? Not, because, not because, at but again, right? So, so again, the system all well intended. So then, maybe there could be something for three one one specific to law enforcement. And so if law enforcement is calling three one one, then maybe it's open for that. We're really trying to get to the solutions component of this. And so, everyone recognizes the problem, right? But how can we collectively? figure out the solutions and move towards that action. And again, maybe funding, right? Maybe that's what it looks like. Maybe the state ultimately steps in and has an overarching 311 system from that perspective and what that looks like. But again, right, this is the part that I'm most passionate about is that there is a potential victim in these instances. The, the connotation that we're bringing people in simply for possession of marijuana is not happening. Right? The connotation that, that uh, the assertion that we are bringing individuals in and, and locking them up, throwing away key for theft by shoplifting, it's not happening. I personally pick up the phone and call the solicitor general and say, what can we do for this gentleman? Right? Here's a case where the families call, some attorneys have called, advocates have called, and we pick up the phone and say, what do we need to do next? Right? How do we speed up and get them on the court calendar? What does that look like? So some level of open communication across the board, right? And ultimately, I, you know, I'm not here to advocate for, advocate for other agencies and departments in as much as we need help, right? The piece that the Public Defender's Office is fighting a bit about conflicting out has caused a larger and larger problem. And that is one that, that you won't hear about until that crisis continues. But I also maintain, right? And I hope you heard this too, because you named the things that you heard uh, growing, right? Which I think is fair. But I hope you also heard that the potential to do both, get people off the floor and continue down this path of getting people out, whatever the services are rent that need to be rented, can be done simultaneously. And then I'll, Alton, if you can just answer the question about what, there should be a mic right by you. So what we'll can the county? Think we're down to one mic. Down to one. All right, we'll speed this up. Okay. What, as a county leader, right? What do you want the city of Atlanta to do? What do you want the activist community to do? What do you want the state to do to help you all address this issue? Well, I think the first thing is it'd be nice for all of us to, to work together, right? Because it's a big problem, uh, and and it can't be solved by any one of us, right? Uh, Pre-arrest diversion is a piece of it. But it's not the total solution, in part because everyone isn't eligible for pre-arrest diversion, right? If somebody stabs someone or shoots someone, they're probably not going to say, okay, we're going to drop you off. The one thing about pre-arrest diversion is it's optional. In other words, if, if I go to the pad and, and I have it and I, I'm, not, I'm off my meds or whatever, I can walk out tomorrow and be back on the street and, and not have dealt with the root cause and not having some place to live, right? So. We need to think and be realistic about how we surround PAD with the types of services that we, in fact, address the issue. Commissioner Hall actually has been leading an effort. She started, we started looking at this issue three years ago. We had discussions with the Louisville Diversion Center. We looked at what they're doing at Miami-Dade, which is probably the gold standard. We looked at what they're doing in Houston, which is probably a silver standard. We looked at what they were doing in other places. She sponsored a number of meetings. So we have been looking at this, and it's a complex issue, and it's really no simple problem. It's not, what can the county do? Um, Latrina Foster left, she's our head of behavioral health. She's been talking to the state for some time about us getting state funding for a center here in Atlanta, or in Fulton County, to help us with this. We've asked a number of times, we haven't been successful, we will, will continue to ask. So that's what I think the county can do. And in terms of the city of Atlanta, I mean, the city of Atlanta is, is the largest 
uh, you know, part of our jail population. I think we have a good working relationship with the new mayor and with the city council. I think we can continue to work together and figure out what we can do. I think the diversion center that's on the way is a part of that, right? But it's not the total solution. We've got to surround it with other stuff. But I would say collaboration and convening these kinds of things, but having the state and the city as well is, is would be a good start. Sorry about that. Hello. Hello. All right. There we go. Um, a couple questions that uh, I want to make sure are we, we tried to weave in a lot of the audience questions here. Uh, and if, if you have some last minute questions, feel free to throw it up there. We only got about ten minutes left. But um, one person had asked about uh, Union City, about how what is the actual overcrowded uh, population, and what, how by how many people are we overcrowded in Union City? That question's for Alton. Or, it seems yeah, like I was going to say 55. 55 people? Okay, got it. 55 young ladies. Okay, because uh, what we were told was just that Union City was, and the, the context of this question was just that the jail, at, the jail at Union City was built because of the overcrowding issue, um, and yeah, it, that's, that's incorrect? That, that's incorrect. It was already built. It was already built. It was okay. It was not built. We, the county bought it. Okay, right. so this person is not. The transfers were, when I was a public defender and women were transferred to Union City and other facilities, the purported purpose was because of overcrowding. In 2019, Southern Center was preparing, at the end of 2019, Southern Center was preparing a letter about overcrowding at Rice Street. And so um, I have seen, I used to have to go visit clients in Hall County, Alpharetta. I, I, so there, this overcrowding is not a new phenomenon. and when. Clients were then being seen in the city. It was because of overcrowding, to our knowledge. Got it. So the, the, in, in 2013, when people were being transferred to Union City due to overcrowding, that was not the case. That that's why that was happening, or what? Well, why? Why do we have overcrowding at Union City as well? Because we don't have enough bed space. Okay. I mean, that's just honestly, right? COVID. So, so the, the other thing piece, we just talked about. The, the other, the other piece that we failed to mention is. Uh, that 54% of our arrests have gone up, right? And these are violent crime arrests. So there are police departments doing their jobs, right? When you have a 90 to 93% clear up rate, because violence has, has you know, run rampant over the last couple of years, they're doing a better job of clearing up those cases, of charging those cases. And so we've gone up 54% just in violent crime arrests, if that makes sense, and hence, uh, both male and female, and so we continue to add to that population. Okay. Um, also, uh, another question that came in, uh, why, uh, why was a feasibility study conducted before uh, an agreement was put forth? Um, what did you do, or excuse me, why was it the feasibility study now being conducted as opposed to being done before an agreement was put in place? Wouldn't it make sense to do a feasibility study then come up with an agreement? We started a feasibility study in January. Last of this year. With the city of Atlanta? No. The, 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 the Oakland County Feasibility Study. Okay. We started it before the, the, the ACDC. Oh, well, actually, we started discussions around ACDC. My, our first conversation with the, with the mayor was in November of 2019. So that's been going on. But the feasibility study itself has nothing to do with that. We realized that the Rice Street Jail, is, which is 40 years old, is, has, has, is, is beyond its useful life. And, and since the next jail we're gonna have is gonna have the last 50 years, we realized that we needed to start to do something. When, when, when Sheriff Labatt came in, he said, with, with, with emphasis, we need to get going on this. And so we went to the Board of Commissioners, and we, and we presented a case, and they were, they, they gave us the approval to move forward. We're spending $1.2 million to develop a feasibility study. You were part of the, the discussion, the interview process, I think a few weeks ago, and so, that's why we're building, we're, we're, we're conducting a feasibility study to answer five questions, right? Do we need a jail? What services should it provide? How big should it be? Where should it be? And how much should it cost? Yeah, my, my question to you when we did that feasibility study was like, why are we building more jets? Why are we not, why, it, it, there, to me, I understand that there need to be facilities that are up to code and, and all of that. I, I think the question became, when are we as a, a city, a county, a state, 
going to get out of the locking people up business and more in the diversion business. That, that to me, is, is at the core of, of the kind of the, the debate in question. I don't know, Sheriff talked about the fact that, well, the crime issue. But what I will tell you, and this, again, is a bit of a narrative. We're not building a new jail because we're building a bigger jail. We're building a new jail because the art of incarceration, the science of incarceration pre-trial has changed in the last four years. We don't have enough space for our own diversion facilities. We don't have enough space for a GED program. We don't have enough space for our cosmetology program. We don't have enough space for our re-entry program. We don't have enough space for our mental health program. The fact of the matter is, we're trying to change the paradigm around the way we incarcerate people before they come to trial. And that's why we're building a jail, not because we want to have more. Well, all of those services that you've talked about, there are amazing both service providers, nonprofit partners, people who have been who provide GED services, who provide educational services. Why not partner with those particular Absolutely. organizations? They would be the ones providing facilities. But if someone's been arrested, we want to have the ability to have them have those programs as part of what they are in. We don't have the space of rights. It wasn't designed like that. Forty years ago, nobody was focused on that. And what we're saying is, in working with partners, that we, in fact, want to change the paradigm. So here again, it's not, a, it's not us doing it. To, what we're saying is, we want to be able to have a, a superstructure that allows those programs to actually take place. The current facility does not allow that. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. Take so just uh, as, as you take the mic, and we got just, uh, uh, just a, a couple minutes left. Um, I think at the core of this question, what I have heard from uh, from a number of organizations, from the questions that have come in, from Tiffany and from, from Robin and from people who are on the commission, uh, was that it, it looks like there is a study that is underway. Y'all have provided some data to the city. The, the, it, it sounds like that didn't uh, appease a lot of the folks who were at the city, uh, that it didn't necessarily pass all the things that they wanted. There is, based on uh, what I'm looking at here, um, the legislation specifically says, the Atlanta City Council hereby requests that the Justice Policy Board, established in an IGA between the City of Atlanta and Fulton County, authorized by 21R4118, uh, convene to establish a jail population review committee, uh, composed of the members of the Justice Policy Board that will, using established best practices, conduct the, the jail population review as described herein and de deliver on the report and the review no later than 90 days of the proposal. And that there are a number of those enumerated things and data points that they have not received to date. So I wonder how we think next week is going to go. Um, and then my other, my, my core of my question is, is there a world in which we can wait for this study? Um, let the people who are from Fulton County, from who are activists, organizers, all of, as you said, you want everyone to come together, work together, partner together, figure this out. You have a commission of those folks. Would it not make sense to wait for them to look at the data, look at the raw data, spend spend the time to do that, and issue a series of recommendations and act against them? No, absolutely not. Okay, so we should not look at the data no, before. It's not that. Yeah. It's not that. It, you should not have to hold hostage a program where we can start affecting a crisis of people sleeping on the floor. Sure, but it's not. And continuing to damage the building, continuing to hurt each other. Can, I had someone killed last week, right? This is a, this crime has been a humanitarian effort that you can do both simultaneously. You can study the numbers all night, every night for the next until November 18th is what they like to do. But we can also get people off the floor. We can start moving people out of the city, out of out of Union City, which which was the the subject of a lawsuit years ago that you brought. I I, I agree with. But we have to be in a position where it's not one way or the other. Is, there not, a reasonable, is there not a reasonable time frame? Because this is, what is the... Why wait? Yeah. Why wait? 
Why if I can, well, because it sounds like it sounds like that the, the data that this group of folks are looking for sounds like they are. It is not satisfying the requirements. Here, to here's, make, the, here's the thing: if you can read further, it does not say it has to be approved. It does not say that there has to be suggestions made. It simply says it has to be done. And so, if it simply has to be done, you do it simultaneously with the already agreed upon getting people off the floor. And to answer your question. Holistically, the easiest way to reduce crime, to reduce the numbers of people in jail, is to ask people to stop committing crimes. It's simple as that. Because the people that we're going after, the people that I formed task force to go after, have committed serious felonies. But I, think that, I, I just and want so, to be clear. What, what you're putting, I don't want to make sure you're not putting words in my mouth. I'm not saying that those who are committing these, these serious crimes that you were talking about, that is certainly not what the, the review board is, is looking to, uh, to, to uh, fight folks on. What I'm hearing is that they are saying that if we had, this is what I'm hearing, if I'm wrong, you let me know. They are saying that if we had data, bond data, raw data, in better these specific types of information. I'm no expert, but that review board surely is, right? So just give me one second to finish that one sentence, right? Which is, they're saying if we had this data, what we would be able to do is to be able to come to the table with a joint goal. I have a six uh, panels to my right. Sorry. The the that if we if we are you're able to come to the table with these particular pieces of data as experts in the field, including people from your office, we would be able to provide better recommendations on what should happen next. Is that not worth us? taking the time with these experts, do they not have the same goal they for humanitarian? No, they don't have the same goal. So you don't believe they have the same goal? Let me push back. Let me push back. I watched the entire city council meeting. Yep. I watched a veteran city council person ask a, a new city council person, even if we acquiesced and gave you what you want, Will you support getting people off the floor? The answer was no. And the answer was no. And so to that extent, all I want to be saying, careful well, to, to stick to the question I think, and, right? and so, which is like we could talk, we can we could definitely critique council all day long. Uh, but the question at hand is this board that y'all have created. Y'all have created. Okay. Y'all have Fulton, created. Fulton County didn't agree to have this board. You're in agreement that this board should exist, correct? No. Policy, not no. You don't agree that the... No, no I don't. Policy. Personally, no. You do not believe that this board I of experts... I vote on it. Okay. So it is much like... Let me, and let me be honest, because Commissioner Hall knows this to be true, uh, because every pre-arrest conversion meeting she had, I made, as chief, I made sure I was there. Every task force meeting that was had about ICE and other things, I made sure I was there, because like you, I wanted to hear for myself. Yeah. And every meeting was one meeting after the other about not doing and not working together. It was a, this it was council, a, this board, that is, I, I just want to stick to this review and, board. And which so is, what I would suggest to you yeah. is that to have a review board, yes. create a committee, to then turn around and take a month and a half to do something. So you're not having the time. Don't do it. I'm it's the timeline issue. I'm not saying don't do it. Okay. I'm saying let's agree to work together to move people in an environment that is much more humane yep. and continue to do that work. May I, may I say something? I, I just, I want, I want to be clear. Under the intergovernmental agreement, the women in Union City must be moved first. If there are 350 people in that jail, that will likely take most, if not half of October. All right, we're moving until November. Then we can move only up to 100 people, and that is leaving 520 something or 420 something people still on the floor in Rice Street. Once we fill the other 350 beds at ACDC that are available, that still leaves over 126 or something like that. I, my, I don't do my doctor's math homework. Uh, still leaves 100 some odd people on the floor in Rice Street. The purpose of this committee isn't necessarily to make recommendations, but what we have seen over the last year 
is government officials show up to council meetings and commission meetings and make claims about data. And we do not believe that the community has had an opportunity to look at that data. I submitted an open records request on August the 11th after the Public Safety and Legal Administration Committee moved that paper from committee to full council. When I submitted that open records request, the response from Fulton County was that they don't, they don't have that data, that they that no one at the Justice Department had briefed the commissioner who issued those numbers. We have had all these conversations about everything that the county has. We have up to three outstanding open records requests, not under the Jail Review Board, not under the Jail Policy Committee. This is as Southern Center for Human Rights and Nonprofit Law Firm. If that data is so readily available, my request in closing is that the results from our requests be promptly submitted to our office because I am troubled by what seems to be an opposition to simply providing the information. If you tomorrow start moving people from Union City, by the time you get to November 18th, you can go ahead and move your additional hundred from Rice Street. But humanitarians are still going to be interested in what is happening to the other people who remain on the floor in Rice Street through the spring of 2023. And that's just math. Again, math that I don't do well. But the, the mathematics say that people will remain on the floor for quite some time. So why not give me the organization? So when I say why not, I mean the spreadsheets with the names or the, the booking numbers and the charges. I don't mean independent analysis of the numbers. I mean simply the numbers. So in, even in the best case scenario, if you move them tomorrow, you're still going to have people on the floor through the new year. What about that? Can I, can I answer the question? Yeah, so uh, we'll close with that. Um, we, we, we want to just have a closing uh, sentiment. But you, you, you're welcome to, to respond to that, and then we'll, we'll just do one thing to close. When, when we presented to the Board of Commissioners and asked for their vote, I'm to, vote like that. To, okay. to ask for the vote, one of the commissioners asked, what happens if we delay? And my, my answer to her was, people, may die. We've had that. We have established. We don't disagree. You can, as, as the sheriff said, you want to have a PhD research process? Go ahead and do it. What we're saying is, what we're saying is, it shouldn't be done at the risk of the people who show up at Rice Street every single day. That's all we're saying. So what I'm hearing, though, is that there is a set of data that people have asked for. You are saying we have that data. It really just sounds like if there is that data, if it is enumerated that you have it, I think there just needs to be a public process in which there is clarity that that data has been received and that that data has had the time for whatever that may be. If it's a day, it's two days, it's three days, I don't know what it is, but that's what I'm hearing is the miscommunication. There's a bunch of folks saying, we want information, this information needs to be evaluated, the raw information needs to be evaluated, Y'all are saying, we have that information. We've been doing that since January. It sounds like this is a pretty easy fix. And right? the best part about that, the best part, not only did we give the information um, to Tim, which we gave to the, the board of commissioners and the city council, our next step is to provide, if you download the sheriff's app, to provide that data updated every hour on, the, on our app. All right? That's our next goal. That's our next technological ask is that of the, of the uh, board so that we can fund that, right? Build a data bridge, anybody can get it. It's kind of like the UCR report for uh, crime that goes out. It'll be at everybody's fingertips. So we're gonna close, I'm gonna let Saba close this out. Uh, we'll just give y'all a quick second to, if there's, I just wanna make sure, we literally got 30 seconds per person because library staff has been here over time. <laughs> uh, it's Taco Tuesday, apparently, at the Lobot House. That's right. Uh, so, That's right. Uh, you know, Tiffany, I've seen her literally on her feet since very early in the morning. Um, so, I, and also, thank you for, for being here. Judge Jungway's got kids, and got a prom, a prom queen uh, at home uh, waiting. Um, so, first, gratitude for the conversation. It's not an easy one. But also, I think that there are opportunities for you to give a little bit to each side here 
has an opportunity to do something just a little bit different based on what they are hearing today. What I'd like for you to close with is if there's something that you can either provide or appeal to that you have heard that you are willing to do to show up to this conversation so that we can all advocate for better change. I think the, the thing we started with is what I want to end with, which is there are more beds, or sorry, there are more people in a facility than there is the capacity and the actual infrastructure to support it. What can we do in the next 30 days uh, to make sure um, that we can actually address this issue that would appeal to those who feel like we do not have the information we need to make good decision making, yet also will appeal to the emergency of doing it as promptly and swiftly as possible. So if we can close on that, if you can give us one thing we can do, we'll go around and then uh, Sabo will close, close this out. All right, so I didn't, I didn't have much to say uh, during this conversation, um, but the one thing we are working on is Project Orca, the county, the state, and the federal government has given the Superior Court um, funds to make sure that people are coming in and out of the criminal justice system as quickly as possible. We need more space. The libraries have to offer us this space to hold trials in, and we need more judges because there's 20 of us, so we can only handle so many cases at one time. If we had more judges, we could see more individuals and get them through the criminal justice system. All right, so we're starting a Kickstarter for judges uh, tonight. We're going to get more judges. Got it. Uh, quickly, first of all, thank you all. Right? And it's certainly always good to have a robust conversation. I want to thank my team, right? Um, the heroes and sheroes that show up every day to do this difficult work. I think the biggest thing I would ask is, right? Don't delay. We can do all things simultaneously. Again, as Al to put it, you can do a whole PhD pro, uh, you know, program on it. You can have scholars from Clark and, and Georgia Tech analyze it until, it until the ink runs dry, whatever that looks like. But we have to move bodies because there is nothing that we're doing that will prohibit anybody that is found to have to, to maybe see a judge quicker or to have a bond made. There's nothing that prohibits that from happening. Doesn't matter the address. My question was, what are you willing to do that might appeal to some of the concerns that you've heard tonight? I, I think I did, right? I'm, uh, the, the data's there, right? Short of someone trying to tell their own narrative around the data, my goal is to put the data out for everybody. Right, and that's the biggest thing. And then we remove that. You know, in my office, I have a little thing that says, you know, no excuse on. Right? Tell me what the excuse is. Let's check that off, and then we move forward. Okay. Fair enough. Yep. Okay. Um, we are always willing to help get people out of jail, and we will continue to be open to working with the county and our national partners to fashion programs that facilitate releases, especially for people who courts have determined can return upon payment of bond. We've also launched a court watching program called Justice Watch Georgia. You can email justicewatch at schr.org. What we'd like to do is ensure that the community has a more holistic picture of what is happening in our courts and can understand what, are the, what the various alternatives offer around the country to deal with the, the criminal legal system in Georgia's unusually high number of people under correction control. We're willing to work with the Justice Policy Board, work with the partners that we're able to, to meet. I want to thank you as well. Um, we want to work with you. Um, so I guess we'll show up when you, when, you, when, you, when you want to have that up. Yeah, I think the data that you shared, it'd be great for us to, to share that with the general public and also to hear from any of the other organizations where there are incompletions there so we can follow up with maybe it was an oversight or, or maybe there's an opportunity to add more information. Thank you. Um, Sorry? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. I'll repeat myself after. Thanks. Uh, what we're willing to do is continue to help people out of jail and provide services to people. So we will reduce recidivism and not all together with Sarah and the revolving door that you all spoke about, helping people providing resources that aren't provided in a free atmosphere. Um, so that to me is a way to cut down on the population that's inside the jail because once the know that they need services. Okay, that was quite the dialogue, um, and we didn't do too bad on time. Uh, again, thank you all 
for being here this evening. I think we could have easily gone another 30 minutes, but I know Mrs. Labatt, and I don't want you to be on the receiving end of that rat. Um, again, just really appreciate all you all in this conversation participating. A couple of things. Uh, one, you listen to the conversation. I'm sure you all had personal thoughts about this. We would love to hear them. You have Madeline, if you can raise your hand who's in the room, who is with Capital B Atlanta. She did a primer uh, to help folks understand how we got to this process. So if you have thoughts, reach out to Madeline. She's a, a reporter who's gonna want to hear what you have to say. Um, I know Ben Brash, if you wanna raise your hand from the AJC is also in the room. So I wanna highlight him. Uh, if, you will, if you want to see more programming like this, please let us know. What kind of topics do you want us to talk about? This is the second topic that we've talked about. The previous one was about the city budget and why folks should engage on what most folks think is a very boring process. Why the hell should I care about city budget, right? So we, we do these types of programs to help you understand what's happening in your community, what's happening in local government, and the role that you can play in it. And so that government's not just happening to you, but you are an active participant in your community. Um, and with that, uh, just one last thing I would say, all the organizations listed on the screen, they all have newsletters. ACC has a newsletter, Capital B has a newsletter, Canopy Atlanta has a newsletter. If you want to find out more stories like this, more programs like this, subscribe to the newsletters. Uh, ACLU, raise your hand is in the back. I just want to make sure that you see them. And I'm pointing these folks out so that you can connect with them as we exit. Again, thank you to the Fulton County staff. Um, I'm sure Alton will approve your overtime for tonight. <laughs> and with that, um, oh, one more thing Senator from, from Rohit. Oh, yes, uh, Karen from Senator Warnock's staff is also here if you want to raise your hand, uh, Karen. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it over to Rohit for one truly final thing, and then we will be out. Yes. Um, just wanted to say two things. One is uh, we are, uh, what I was saying earlier is that we're going to take the data that you have provided, try to be able to publish that uh, publicly. Um, also, any of the organizations that are involved in this, if there are questions or holes that you see in that data or other things that you are looking for, we're happy to facilitate that conversation. I, I wanted to uh, make sure we thank the staff uh, that was here um, and also to thank Commissioner Hall for helping uh, facilitate us getting this uh, physical space for this open conversation. So thank you to Commissioner Hall, thank you to Fulton County, uh, thank you to Saba and the entire panel. Um, we hope you have a great evening and take this conversation to your community so it doesn't stop here. Thank you. Here, they should have been part of the conversation. We had Chief Judge Cassandra Kirk, who a lot of the sentencing happens through. We had Latrina Foster from Behavioral Health and Developmental District.